Welcome to the Get Fit Guys Quick and Dirty Tips to Get Moving and Shape Up. My name is Brock Armstrong and I am the Get Fit Guy. As widespread as the BMI method of body measurement is, the ever-growing consensus is that this one-size-fits-all approach may actually be flawed. Body mass index, or BMI, is a mathematical formula that divides a person's weight by the square of their height to arrive at a number that falls into one of the following body weight categories. Very severely underweight, severely underweight, just plain underweight, normal, a healthy weight, overweight, obese class 1, which is also known as moderately obese, obese class 2, which is severely obese, and finally obese class 3, which is very seriously obese. Beyond assigning one of these categories, a high BMI can also be an indicator of high body fat and therefore can be used to screen for certain weight levels that could lead to health problems. Now, even though it is often used as one, it is not a true diagnostic of body fatness or of an individual's overall health. As most of us fitness-focused folks have likely heard, BMI is far from a perfect measurement. Much of the time, and often when it really counts, the BMI measurement may actually overestimate or even underestimate a person's body fat. And when it does, it really does, and we'll find out more about that later. A common example that people use when they're talking smack about BMI is that it doesn't distinguish between body fat and muscle mass, which is important because a hunk of muscle weighs more than the same size hunk of fat. Some good examples of this misinterpretation, according to an analysis of BMI's blind spots, are former Olympians Usain Bolt and Michael Phelps, who both just narrowly miss the overweight camp. Then there is the star NFL quarterback Tom Brady, whose BMI categorizes him as obese. Also, basketball player LeBron James and NHL right winger Phil Kessel both have a BMI of 27.5. And as we'll learn later, a BMI between 25 and 29.9 is considered overweight. So, how does this kooky error happen? Well, okay, imagine a sedentary person who is 1.83 meters tall, or 6 feet tall, who also weighs 92 kilograms, or 203 pounds they would have a BMI of 27. Now imagine a sprinter who is also 1.83 meters or 6 feet tall, but weighs 96 kilograms or 211 pounds instead of 203. Well, they would have a BMI of 28. So, according to the BMI, the sprinter is more overweight than the sedentary person. But, as I said earlier, a glob of muscle weighs about 18% more than the same size glob of fat, so this is clearly not an accurate statement. And this isn't the only place that BMI falls apart either. BMI is also not reliable to use on elderly adults who generally have lost some amount of muscle and bone mass. In this case, an elderly person's BMI could be within normal range while they actually might be overweight. It's also important to mention that the BMI calculation is based primarily on Caucasian body types and may not be appropriate at all for people of other ethnicities. When compared to white Europeans of the same BMI, Asians in particular have a 4% higher total body fat. And South Asians actually have an especially high level of abdominal obesity, which can totally throw off the BMI measurement as well. Now, a person whose BMI says they are overweight or even obese is generally considered unhealthy, while people with a normal BMI are generally categorized as healthy. But research published in 2016 suggested that this was incorrect for 75 million Americans. Researchers found that 54 million Americans had been classed as overweight or obese, but with further investigation, they found that other cardiometabolic measures, which is things like blood pressure, blood sugar, and cholesterol, showed that they were actually perfectly healthy. 
And then another 21 million people were classed as normal in terms of BMI, but were later determined to be unhealthy, based again on those same cardiometabolic measures. To determine this discrepancy, the researchers examined data from the U.S. National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey and analyzed the link between BMI and a range of other normal health markers, again, like blood pressure, blood sugar, and cholesterol, and found that BMI incorrectly pegged people's health at both ends of the weight scale. Other scientists, however, have suggested that although some people may appear to be overweight but healthy, the extra weight still puts them at a higher risk of certain diseases as they get older. So there is some dissension in the ranks. So where did this all start? Interestingly, BMI is not new at all. Way back in the 1840s, a Belgian statistician named Adolf Ketelet devised what he named the Ketelet Index of Obesity, which calculated obesity using a simple mathematic formula, specifically by dividing a person's weight in pounds or kilograms by the square of his or her height in centimeters or inches. The formula is written out as W slash H2. Now, Ketelet apparently famously wrote the words... If a man increased equally in all dimensions, his weight at different ages would be as the cube of his height. Now, he went on to explain that in the first year of life, our breadth is indeed larger in proportion to our height, but after that, we grow taller in relation to our width. Now, it's really important to point out that when he developed this index, Ketelet had no interest in studying obesity. Ketelet was actually interested in applying probability calculus to human physical characteristics, and that's what led him to develop an index of relative weight. He then used this index to study the growth of a normal human, having established that during normal growth, weight tends to increase in relation to height in meters squared. And after World War II, when reports of increased mortality and morbidity of overweight and obese life insurance policyholders, um, and by that I mean people, the Ketelet Index validity was confirmed and brought into practice as a useful index of general relative body weight. It was then renamed to the Body Mass Index and adopted by the World Health Organization in 1995 as a simple tool to quickly and easily guesstimate levels of obesity. BMI became an international standard for obesity measurement in the 1980s, and the general public learned about it in the 1990s when the United States government launched an initiative to encourage healthy eating and exercise. And you may remember this as the Clinton Health Plan, which is generally thought of to be a complete failure. But before the 1980s, doctors generally used what was called a weight for height table, a different one for men and for women, that outlined ranges of body weights for each inch of an individual's height. But these tables were also limited because they used solely body weight and not body composition. Now, if you're old enough, you may remember your doctor using one of these charts that made you find your height along the left side and then slide your finger along to the right to find your ideal weight. Ah, uh, the good old analog days. I miss them. Now, in 1998, the National Institutes of Health lowered the overweight threshold for BMI from 27.8 to 25 to match with international guidelines. And that move alone added about 30 million American citizens who were previously thought to be of a healthy weight to the overweight category. And that is where we are still today. So, you may be asking yourself, why do we still use BMI? Well, in the paper, Obesity, BMI, and Health, a Critical Review, the authors state, a little confusingly, <laughs> clearly, obesity, as determined by BMI, is not a monotypic, agent-variant condition requiring a general public health preventative approach. A BMI-determined categorization of an individual should not be used exclusively in counseling or in the design of a treatment regimen. And yet, BMI remains a common tool for judging body composition. A graduate researcher named Travis Saunders from the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario Research Institute in Ottawa says of BMI, 
It's most useful in population studies, but if you try to apply it to individuals, it doesn't work. And this is due in part to the fact that it is as important where you store the fat as it is how much fat you are storing. Abdominal fat in particular, a type called visceral fat that accumulates between our organs instead of being stored beneath our skin, is particularly problematic. Fat on the hips, the buttocks, and the lower body appear to be much less of a health problem. For that, and other reasons that we've covered, many doctors today now measure waist circumference as a proxy for visceral fat. Using this measurement, men's waists should be less than 102 centimeters, or 40 inches, and women's should be less than 88 centimeters, or 35 inches. So, what's better than using BMI? Well, in a recent paper published by the Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research, it was concluded that although many BMI-based equations produce similar group mean values as a 4C model of body measurement, which is a skinfold caliber measurement on four body parts, and we'll talk about that more later, a protocol with the very catchy name SF7JP, which is a skinfold caliper measurement of seven body parts, actually produced the smallest individual errors when compared to the gold standards of underwater weighing and dual energy X-ray absorptometry, or DEXA. Now that study took 150 adults, 63 women and 67 men between the ages of 18 and 28 and calculated their BMI as weight in kilograms divided by height squared in meters squared. Then their body fat percentage was predicted using four different BMI equations and then from the SF7JP test, the seven skinfold test. In the end, the seven-site test was by far the closest to the much more involved, invasive, and costly underwater or DEXA tests. Now this is good news for physicians who are willing to learn how to use the skinfold calipers and who are also able to spend the time necessary with their patients to measure all seven sites of their body. It is even better news for the elderly, the extremely fit, and the people of ethnicities that do not benefit from the current BMI calculations. But since this study was only published in January of 2018, we'll likely have a bit of a wait before we start getting pinched in uncomfortable locations by our GP in our regular physicals. So what is a skinfold test? Well, this is one of the oldest and most common methods of determining a person's body composition. It is done by measuring the skinfold thickness at specific locations around the body. The thickness of these folds is a measure of the fat that's under the skin, the subcutaneous adipose tissue. Once the thickness of the skin is measured, formulas based on gender and age are used to convert these numbers into an estimate of the person's percentage of body fat. Now, to say this test is not pretty or fun is an understatement. <laughs> to perform this test, the technician actually pinches the skin with a metal caliper to measure it in millimeters and then pulls the skin fold away from the muscle underneath. That way you can be certain that only the skin and fat tissue are being pinched. Two measurements are usually done at each site and then averaged and calculated using the formula. The places on the body where you get pinched vary depending on the protocol, but usually include these seven locations. Your triceps, the upper back of your arm, your pectoral, which is the mid-chest, your subscapular, the edge of the shoulder blade, the mid-axilla, which is under your armpits, the abdomen, usually right next to your belly button, the suprailiac, which is the top of your hip joint, which is otherwise known as your love handles, and finally, your quadriceps, which is the front of your thigh. Now, as we learned earlier from Canadian researcher Travis Saunders, BMI is still useful for population studies where simplicity is key if you want anyone to bother responding to your survey. Also, a person who has a high BMI is likely to have too much fat in their abdomen, along with other unhealthy locations like the heart and the liver. And that is why, despite all its flaws, BMI is still useful to a certain extent. 
Ultimately, when it comes to using the BMI, we need to keep in mind that it is not an accurate measure of health or of physiological state like blood pressure or a blood test that can actually indicate the presence of disease. At its core, it is only a rough estimate of your size. Now, there are people out there who have a high or low BMI who are also very healthy. And conversely, plenty of people with a normal BMI who are quite unhealthy. For example, a person with a perfectly normal BMI who is also sedentary, smokes, and also has the unfortunate family history or genetics of cardiovascular disease will surely have a higher risk of early death than another more genetically fortunate person who has a higher BMI but is also physically fit and a non-smoker, right? So, I think it's a really good thing to know your BMI, but to also recognize its limitations. Now, what are you waiting for? Get out there and measure that waist. <laughs> <laughs>